My name is Philip. Um, I'm the co-founder of a company called Franca Emica. We are a global company or a company with global reach with Bavarian roots. Uh, I tried to show this today with my uh, jacket uh, all the way in Singapore, despite the heat. And um, I want to talk to you about robots, obviously. Um, that's what we do. That's what have we been doing for, for the last couple of years. Uh, Everybody's talking about robots, everybody's talking about AI lately, the last few years more and more so. Uh, when we talk about this, I always try to picture the, the really, really big picture, um, looking, about, well, looking back in time. Uh, mankind has always described different times and different ages through the tools that we've used. Um, starting at the Stone Age, we discovered that we could use a stone pick in order to be more creative and more powerful and help ourselves and create more and bigger things. Uh, so on and so forth. We had a few revolutions, industrial revolutions, but well, also other revolutions. Um, and uh, we are, I guess, living through one right now, um, the fourth uh, or the second digital revolution, so to speak. And we strongly believe that we already are right now in the age of robotics. And uh, that is not supposed to sound very dawning. It's actually quite promising um, seeing the robot as a tool. So the robot is not really that something that threatens us, but it helps us to be more powerful, to be more creative, to build bigger and better and faster things. By the way, do, I have, do we have a clicker? Sorry. Um, also, do we have my slides on somewhere? Or can you all see these? Aha, uh -huh. great. Um, all right. So let me ask you, what do you imagine or do, what do you picture when you think of artificial intelligence? This? And what do you picture or imagine when you, when you think of robotics or of robots? This? Or is it more so something like this, or this, or this? Okay, now they all look quite threatening, but there's also another really cool movie, if you haven't seen it, Robot and Frank, something like this. So talking about a real robot walking, talking amongst us, helping us out, trying to, to help us with labor. However, this is a recent picture in, a, in the German newspaper uh, which was talking about AI. And how do we picture AI or how do we present AI? We use robots. So obviously also very, um, as a European, a very daunting picture, having the US and China running. China seems a bit faster even than the US by now, and Europe is somewhere there in the back. Talking about AI, this is actually where we are. I showed this picture just a couple of minutes before. Maybe you've recognized it. Uh, most of you have been around by then, 1996. Great, great moment uh, of chess, or bad moment of chess, however you see it. Gary um, Kasparov was beaten by the machine, by the arti artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, Deep Blue by IBM in chess for the first time. So the robot, the machine, beat us humans in such a complicated game. But we're talking about robots and AI, and we look at this picture, and maybe then we start to think, who's that guy? We know Gary, he's playing chess, but he's not playing against a human, is he? He's playing against a machine. So the machine is smart enough to beat him in chess but it's not capable of moving its own figures? Seems odd. So what have robots been up to? Because ro robots have been around, despite there are not many here, as, well, as far as we know, except for this guy. Robots typically do tasks like welding, they, they paint, they lift heavy objects. Very limited, though, and mostly in automotive, as we know. So this is typically uh, what an automotion or automotive cell or automotive line looks like. And 
even though without having any idea about automation or robotics or automotive whatsoever, looking at the picture, we instantly know this is very expensive to set up. And it takes a very, very long time and very high-skilled workers to make this work. There's been a lot of change lately in robotics, so new companies emerged and new, a new style or a new kind of robotics robots have been around, so these, so, so to speak, collaborative robots. Robots that don't need to be uh, behind safety fences because they don't harm us, so they can work alongside with us humans. Um, there's many of them. Every major company has at least one model in this uh, new trendy uh, field, but many, many new companies uh, arose lately. However, how come that we moved from this horrifying image uh, to this, and from this to this, or to this. Maybe people here in the region are a bit more aware of these factories, of these sweatshops, of these slavery uh, sweatshops. In Europe, not so much. We all use this, this high-tech uh, Gears, iPhones, smartphones, computers, we have no idea where they're made. Well, we know somewhere in Asia, in China mostly, but we have no idea in which circumstances they've been made. And whether it's automated or it's manual labor, and in fact, it's manual labor. That's why none of these models or, or uh, products are being produced in Europe anymore. In fact, the last computer factory just shut down in Germany, and that was the last computer factory of whole Europe. So, in all Europe, there's no computer factory left. They all moved here. Why? Well, obviously, it's expensive to hire a lot of labor. And apparently, you need to hire a lot of labor because all these tasks are being, man being done manually in these sweatshops. And a lot of these tasks are actually really, really dull and simple, like very repetitive. Not, they don't require any intelligence or intellect or, or any special skill, really. It's just really pushing buttons, flipping things, uh, inserting USB sticks or, or cables or whatsoever. So why do factories look like this and not like this? Because a while ago, we started with the invention of robotics or robots in order to help ourselves, right, to be freed of all this slavery. That's literally what robots mean. And robots today at home, maybe some of you have one of these models or sort of one of these, look like this. So they all have one thing in common. They have no arms. Right? They might be quite smart. They might be able to recognize you or to tell you whether you're happy or whether you, maybe you're sick. They, they can clean your floor. They can show you where the bathroom is. Forget these arms. They're just waving around. But none of them, literally none of them, are able to hand you something, to give you something. So they're not able to manipulate, right? They have no arms. And really, I mean, what is robotics all about? We want them to do stuff. We want robots to do things for us. What do you do with no arms, right? No arms, no chocolate, I used to say. I still say. So. 20 years later, 2016, technology has, has become more and more powerful and more um, was smarter than before. And in 2016, uh, Google, uh, Google's Deep Blue, beat us in Go, which is highly more complicated than chess. Brilliant. Who's that guy? It's 2016, for God's sake. The machine beats us in Go but cannot move a simple stone from A to B? Really? Why not? Because physical manipulation is extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. In fact, it took us billions of years to figure out how, right? I mean, we could move, single cell organisms could move around autonomously billions of years until we could use a stone, a stone uh, pick to create another tool, it's billions of years later. 
And this sort of funny video is quite good in picturing it because the robot does exactly what he's supposed to do. He's gripping the, the uh, valve there and moving it. But he doesn't notice he's actually not gripping it. He's just on the wrong position. So somewhere an error happened before, he's positioned it. And he thinks he's holding it. So he's doing everything as he's supposed to and using the force, but he's not holding it. Hence, he's falling down. That would never happen to a human. Why not? Because we feel. We feel I have the force. I feel I'm gripping this table and I could pull it if I wanted to. Yes. Very humorous indeed. Hysterical, in fact. Let me pause this for a second. <laughs> so, maybe you know this guy, Data, uh, from Star Trek. Pretty cool. Pretty cool robot. So, manipulation is obviously very difficult and we can only manipulate and interact if we have a sense of touch. And we can sense, well, we have five senses as humans, uh, at least five, um, some argue more, but five we know we have. We can see, we can hear, we can taste, we can smell, and we can feel. And we can feel, for once, through our skin, for very delicate, uh, small uh, things, but we can feel through our arms and through our legs and everything inertially. So we, we have our ligaments and they enable us to feel, right? I can hold this up and I know I hold this up even if I wear a glove. I can still feel this, not through my skin, but I feel it through my arm, through each of the joints. I feel the weight and I've learned over years what that means. So there's a weight pulling down, so I have to lift it up a little bit. I know which muscles I have to, have to contract and how much so that I don't destroy it or also I don't you know, let it fall down and then I'll shoot it up. I, I know all this, right? And my, my brain actually does that for me. I don't even have to think about it. It's a control working there that we can do these things. But it takes very long time. It takes us humans literally 15, 16 years to fully evolve these sort of sense and, and the mechanisms. If you think about the little children, in the, mo in the beginning they can't do anything, right? They just move around. They have to learn their own kinematics. What happens if I flex or, or contract muscles and, and, and uh, how do I move them? After a while, they they're able to hold up their own arms and they can start to manipulate. They put these huge squares into the puzzles and the, and the triangles. Rather simple for us, but it's actually very difficult and they need to learn how do I get this in? Just like this? Or is there maybe a smarter way which gives me more success if I sort of feel it in, right? It takes years and years and years. Eventually, they can solve that puzzle, yet they cannot put the key into the house, in the house door. It's the same thing, really, just more complex. But they learn the one thing, and of that, they build more knowledge, and after maybe two years, three years, they learn how to put that key in. Not because they don't have the power before, the muscle, they do have the, the, the force, but it's just so complex to, to move and insert these things. Back to data. So, this is basically, at least I know for me, that's what I depicted. When I was young and I watched Data uh, laughing on television in German. Yes. Because um, we dub everything. Very humorous obviously. indeed. Hysterical, in fact. I figured out by the time I grow up, sort of this is going <laughs> to happen, right? Robots are going to be there walking our streets. But actually, I'm sort of grown up by now and it's more like this. Right? We have all the data at any time, everywhere, behind the screen. So, in short, because I really like data, what did we expect? What do we expect? We expect data. Data was promised to us, but all we see was data. This is a quote of my good friend and co-founder, Professor Haradin, um, and I always like to bring it up. So, Enough of that. So why don't we have robots everywhere, right? I talked about the sense of touch. We need to be able to manipulate in order to really uh, have robots somewhere around us. Robots are extremely expensive. Nobody knows how to use them. To program them takes weeks and months, and you need highly trained experts. And it doesn't scale at all, right? If you want to program 100 robots, you need to program 100 robots at a time. Even though they're doing the same thing, you have to start all over again. That is robot programming today. Yesterday. Because today we do it differently. Let me introduce you 
to this girl, Franca. Obviously, it's a safe robot. It's a collaborative robot. It's very intuitive and easy to interact with. You can use just haptic feedback and haptic gestures to interact with it, like with your coworker. You can tap him on the shoulder if he's disturbing you or doing something wrong or showing him things how to do. It's extremely sensitive, so it can feel up to a newton um, or smaller even at the end. So if you want to do a really delicate process, the robot is able to feel it. And it can change its behavior like we can. We can flex our muscles or be compliant and flexible. And these features allow the robot to really interact with the physical environment and to really do stuff, as dull and as simple as that sounds. And you saw maybe how it was grasping the screw. It knew where the screw was, ish. That's how we do it, right? If I want a screw, I see where the next screw is, ish. But then I feel it. I feel if, I, if my, my screwdriver has grasped the screw. Videos are always great. I showed a lot of videos on my last uh, talk um, at DLD. I didn't have a robot back then. So I promised I brought one. I brought one, I, not on carry-on, but I actually checked it in um, on the airplane. Uh, and it worked. Um, so now I can actually show you a real robot. So this is um, Franca. Uh, she has, it's a, it's a girl. Um, she has seven degrees of freedom, so seven joints, which is very similar to what we humans have, including our shoulder joint. So what that means, the workspace of the robot is very similar to what we work in. So if I work at a desk, do something, and I go away, I can put the robot there. It can actually work in the same workspace without changing everything. Most robots have six degrees of freedom, which is much, much simpler, and it's enough to get to any point in space. but only through one configuration. So each joint needs to be exactly the same way. With the seventh degree, you have one more than necessary, but enables you to be at the same spot through different configurations. Right? I can move the robot without moving the orientation of the, of the end effect of the hand in that sense, that we can do, right? And it allows us to manipulate from different sides, for example. With six degrees, I would have to go like this to put the screw in here. With seven, I can do it like this if I'm trained well enough. So the robot weighs roughly 18 kilograms. Um, and you see me moving it around very easily. And that is not because I recently started going to the gym and spinning. Uh, it's actually because it's very, very easy. Because I'm not really moving it. It's moving itself very much comparable to your car, to your power steering, I think it's called, because we don't physically move the tires anymore, right? We just move the wheel and the electronics behind it. They understand what we want to do. They move all the, um, the axes and the tires for us. Same principle, just a bit more complicated through the seven degrees of freedom, obviously. So seven dimensions um, is a bit of ugly mass behind there. but. So this is obviously fun. As you can see, I can do this for another hour. I think I have one hour for the talk we agreed on. Um, but we can actually do pretty cool stuff. Let me show you this. If we can go to the screen. Yeah. We can program it, actually live, if we want to. Actually, if somebody wants to come on stage, um, that would be awesome. Uh, anyone who's not afraid of robots, all right, there you go. Hasn't so far. It's like a dog, you know? It never bites until it bites. Um, no, she doesn't bite. So first of all, it's safe in a way, no matter where you put your hands and no matter how it moves, it is impossible that you hurt yourself, right? So it can't uh, snap off your fingers or, or um, anything. If you, if you, um, what's Can your I name, by the way? Oh, okay. oh, my name is Dolphin. Ayin. Dolphin is okay. Yeah. Dolphin or Ayin? 
<laughs> I can't pronounce fast. All right, it's Philip. Um, so you can press these two buttons here l gently, and then it will just follow wherever you want to move it. The eyes? No. No, there's not the eyes. No, the eyes are s hidden somewhere. Move it around. Oh, okay, okay. What are these buttons? Aha. Great. <laughs> they are actually a pretty cool invention. Um, so it moves, right? It follows you yeah, very easily. And if you press it too hard, it will stop. Meaning if you clinch and you're out of control, okay. it will stop. And if you press too lightly, also it will stop. So you need to be in control at all time, which I believe you are. So these buttons are called a pilot. Because robot programming, as I said, it's very complicated, right? Have you ever programmed a robot? Mm. Awesome. Let's, do you want to do it? Oh, okay. OK. Let's, let's um, actually open a new program. We'll call it Dolphin. Is that, is that correct? OK. So it's a new program. The way the robot works is with apps. Um, just like our smartphones, our computers, uh, we don't really need to understand how they work and what they do, how they do it. We just need to understand, I have one more minute that is not going to work. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll make five. I will try. We have to be very quick. Um, but it's easy because it's a quick programming. So maybe you want to pull this one. This means just a motion, the, the cut motion. You can just drag and drop it into the line. And if you click on it one more time, it will ask you for input. So it will ask you, because it, now it understands I have to move. I have to move in the Cartesian space. It knows that. It knows how to do that. But it doesn't know where to move, right? Like when you set your alarm clock on your iPhone, the, the app knows it needs to wake you up, but it doesn't know when and with which ring, ringtone. That's the information that you provide. So you can provide the information of where it's supposed to move by the robot itself. So if you want to come back to to uh, uh, this point, so you can move it somewhere, and then you can interact with the software through this pilot. So you can either save points on the software. It's actually not a software, it's a browser, so um, obviously browser-based. Or you can use the pilot, so in the sense you don't have to jump back and forth between the computer okay. and the robot. So you just move it somewhere, and then you can click on this button to, to, oh, to memorize. Uh, to memorize. Okay. Thank you. So it will just memorize the points, not, not press? Yeah, yeah, press it. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. So Feedback. Oh, okay. So maybe somewhere else. And maybe we can stay on the software for just for a second, because I think everybody can see us here. A little bit harder. Or is the sound off? Oh, yeah, we have quite a few points now. OK, there you go. Maybe another point. OK. Brilliant. So we're done with points, so we'll press the OK button. Oh, we don't see the software anyway. I see it. Um, if we, can we go on the screen? Yeah. Aha, we are. Brilliant. So we can continue either here or there. It will now ask which speed. So all information that I sort of know, how fast do I want it to move? Again, you can um, make it faster with this button here, the one that lit up. Right, you see 45, 50%. That's good. And then press uh, OK again. Now the acceleration. We can accelerate it a little bit faster because we don't have time. OK, fine. Oh, that's very fast. Brilliant. <laughs> Let's see if that works. Running We're running out of time. But I've got one more thing. So um, let's try. You want to press pay? Yeah, just on this. OK, that, that was actually what happened now. <laughs> it wanted to accelerate so fast that obviously there is a vibration, because obviously this table is not very stable. And therefore, it feels forces in its joint and thinks there's a collision. So we could either now make it move a bit slower, or we can set up the threshold for um, for collisions, but let's go down with acceleration and let's try again. And it's moving just like we programmed it to. Brilliant! Oh. Thank you. Yeah. 
So, oh, that's the wrong program. And I said the behavior of the arm can change, right? Like we can change our arm. The motors are all running, but I told it right now to be very stiff, but a little bit flexible, like a little bit damping. So, actually, you could have stayed on stage. Are you still here? No, she left. Always the same. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, despite the movement of the, of the table, it's quite stiff with a high damping, right? I could change that to be, you know, um, with less damping and swinging up and down. So everything, obviously, there is no real spring or no feather in there. It's all software, so... Uh -huh. I didn't change the position. Great. Let's do it this way. Awesome. Now I just said be less damped. The damping is down, so I can put it and it will slightly go back, right? Meaning, any behavior is possible and that allows us to engage and interact physically. Um, yeah, let's go back to the presentation because I don't want to get kicked out of stage. Um, so I'm just going to put it in chill mode. Her, I should say. Just to show a use case, for example, this one is in automotive, although we don't really go in automotive so much, more in electronics. But you can see this use case is not made for automation. This is actually manual labor. Nothing there is precise, and now the guy actually changed the tray. Every automation uh, solution would fail unless you have a human-like sense of touch. And what would a human do? This. And it feels, oh, there's a mistake. Somebody forgot the, um, the gear in the prior setup. So very, very easy. I would like to show these also on stage, but um, it's a bit uh, complicated. Hey, what are you doing? Aha. She's angry. She wants to uh, do more use cases. So wait, she's pulling out my USB. Well, that's not nice. How am I supposed to be finish my presentation? I still have 20 minutes or so to fill. Aha, not? All right, shall we finish up then? Can you put it back in? And how complicated it is to put in a USB stick, you've all experienced yourself. We often fail, even though we are so well trained, right? We, use, we need three times to put it in, meaning even though we are correctly aligned, Ah, damn it. Even though we are correctly aligned, we don't get it in. Now I got it in. It took a bit long, but this is a live demo, so... Um, it's extremely delicate. And why would you want to put a USB stick into a computer by a robot, you would, might think? Well, millions and millions of people in these sweatshops are doing it right now, just a few hundred miles from here. Every, almost every electronic device that you own and that we buy has USB plugs, HDMI plugs, power plugs, lightning plugs, and they're all being put together. And how can I sell it for you for a thousand or a few thousand dollars unless I make sure it works? How do I make sure it works? I need to test it, meaning I need to put in each plug see if the data comes through correctly, correctly, and then pull it out again. And who's doing that right now? Millions of people doing it day in, day out. That's how relevant these cases are. So I'm going to skip all this. Uh, I was going to talk in the next 20 minutes about how important it is to bring this sort of technology and this new generation of robotics into schools and into education. We've talked a little bit about this before as well. Uh, we came up with a curricula, and we're actually teaching it already in the first schools in Germany. If I have one more minute, I can show the last video. One. In the next decade, the new generation That's a concept of we came up with. We uh, started a non-profit organization, a foundation, taking on laborers and to set up these sort of aiding us in our daily lives. Robot this factories. technology gives rise to the need as well as to the opportunity 
for us humans to become more familiar with robotics from a young age on, we need to become robo-natives. The current educational system needs to adapt in order to provide the robo-natives with the necessary skills and knowledge. To accomplish this, we created the Roboterfabrik, a holistic concept that provides a thorough theoretical background and hands-on experience with cutting-edge robotechnology to students, teachers and engineers. Building on the support of universities, robot suppliers, local politics, companies and schools alike, we provide robotics education for everyone. In a first public showcase at the Ideen Expo, Germany's largest educational fair, groups of students presented their projects utilizing the newest generation of collaborative robots. A fundamental part of our concept are Robothons, in which we train our students in applied robotics. The first Robothon 2017 focused on a scenario in which everyday tasks were solved in close interaction with a collaborative robot. Imagine, you have a visitor and don't even have to get up to open the door. Our students can help you with that, using a highly sensitive robot with a camera. After the visitor has entered, a quick snack and a drink are prepared. Since we are talking about students here, you can bet that alcohol is involved. But don't worry, the education of the students was still our number one priority, as they learned to work together in groups combining their technical expertise while simultaneously enhancing their soft skills such as teamwork and time management. They could make their own suggestions for daily tasks they always wanted to solve with robots, as long as they were not too crazy. The only other requirement was to focus the scenario on human-robot interaction. This kind of project was only recently made possible by the new generation of safe, intuitive and affordable robots. Now, after a relaxed evening, the robot begins to clean up. And if your guest was a bad loser, it can even finish that game you guys started. Our educational concept was received very positively by universities, schools, companies and politics all over Germany. After the very successful pilot project in Hanover, we now plan to transfer the Roboterfabrik to other locations in Germany and even worldwide. Thank you for watching. And thank you for listening.